This is Dialogue Conspiracy. Political research specialist May Russell, whose conspiracy newsletter appears in The Realist magazine, has for three years shared with our listeners the fruits of her decades' research into political assassinations and the abuses of power in America. Her weekly commentary relates the news of the week to the evidence emerging about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains its power by force over America's electoral and executive processes. And now, here's May. Good afternoon on Dialogue Conspiracy, April 29th, 1974. Um, I was expecting some big news from Mayor Aliota in San Francisco. Um, it seemed that he had some special announcement to make with regard to the zebra killings, and he rushed back to San Francisco, and all that came over the news that I could pick up before we went on the air today was that they had one of two guns that were allegedly used in these particular killings, and he referred to one gun as being, I think the term was cold or clean, that they couldn't trace the origin of where it came from. And that reminded me of the um, articles that Victor Marchetti wrote that are coming out in his book, the one on the CIA that's caused so much concern with the courts that they wanted to delete parts of these books so that the public couldn't read them. Victor Marchetti worked for the CIA for years, and in one of his comments about the CIA, which was in computer and automation in February 72, he talked about the fact that the CIA has a big depot in the Midwest United States where they have all kinds of military equipment, all kinds of unmarked weapons, and over the years they have bought everything they can get their hands on all, all over the world that is untraceable to prepare for the contingency that they may want to ship arms to a group or a place. And they used to send buyers around to buy arms even from the Soviet bloc countries. Now, Marchetti claims that the members of the CIA that are involved in killings or assassinations are, that he says they're not immoral, they're amoral. The director made a speech to the National Press Club where he said, you've got to trust us. This was Richard Helms. But Marchetti went on to say that the CIA was talking about infiltrating into the United States, doing more than gathering information, and that he felt it was very possible that they could take over in this country and uh, with paramilitary operations such as Vietnam or uh, Southeast Asia, the Cambodia, Laos, and so forth, Philippines, all over the world. And I think that the weapon that's found in the zebra killing will be um, not much different than the weapon that Lawrence Kwong owned. He was the man who uh, shot a man working at KGO radio station, Ben Munson, and then killed himself. And he was supposed to be a former mental patient, and the mystery of the doctors that treated him, um, were, the hearings were very hush about uh, who treated Lawrence Kwong, what kind of treatment he had, and I've maintained on various radio shows that I believe he was electronically controlled and programmed, and we're going to talk more about that on the show today. And I feel that he couldn't trace where his weapon came from, and I think we're going to find a large series of untraceable weapons because I have said it before, and I'll say it today, and I'll say it in the future. I feel that what we're seeing now is the Phoenix program brought from Southeast Asia to the United States to start a race war in this country and that these series of killings will just keep escalating and it will be attributed to um, minorities and gangs, terrorists, where it actually is part of a military operation. One thing that Mayor Aliotto said in San Francisco was that he was going to link 60 deaths to these particular operations up and down the state. Well, I could list 60 deaths up and down the state that are done by or encouraged by or protected by the law enforcement agencies, and I've maintained that there is this link of deaths, but that they're military operations and not radical uh, murders, and they're not cult murders, but they are military operations to scare the population to ask for police protection and a police state. Now, I noticed in the paper this week up in Sacramento, there is a bill to be introduced on, at the Senate. And this is the way the bill reads, under coroners. It said it would allow the coroner to determine the extent of inquiry into violent, sudden, or unusual deaths. This is Senate Bill 2233, entered by Senator Moscone, M-O-S-C-O-N-E, Democrat from San Francisco. 
I wrote a letter to Senator Moscone dated April 29th. It said, I am writing in regards to Senate Bill 2233 concerning coroners in California. As I understand the bill, it would allow the coroner to determine the extent of ear inquiry into violent, sudden, and unusual deaths. The coroner usually would be the sole person determining the extent of inquiry. For 10 years, I have done research into such kinds of deaths, and I am at the present time writing a book titled Murderville, USA. In that book, I go into the role of the political coroner, the government agent, and how he plays a major role in, co in concealing criminal conspiracies. Even the death of hippies or the Edmund Kemper massacres and many deaths not recognized as political are political conspiracies. A political conspiracy does not necessarily refer to specific politicians or candidates for office. Many crimes are concealed for social, legal, and political effect, and these specific deaths are caused to change the decision of a court or to the cultural climate, such as coming down on hitchhikers or hippies or killing the uh, Indian leader Richard Oakes and concealing these crimes. These don't look like political murders, and they actually are. I'm requesting to appear before your hearings as a witness to present evidence that this bill should be turned down. In its place, a bill should be stated as follows. In the event of violent, sudden, or unusual deaths, a team of five doctors, all unrelated to any military or government agencies, should be called in to give objective autopsy reports individually on the cause of death. They would not consult each other in advance, but would give their opinion as to whether persons had been poisoned first or had surgical implants for behavior modification or injuries described as that cause of death. There is good reason to open up many official autopsies. Sincerely, May Russell. I referred also to February 1973, the article in Computer and Automation by Dr. Cyril Wecht. He's the chief coroner at Allegheny County in, in Pennsylvania, and he's a lawyer, and he's written articles and gone to the National Archives to show the bad autopsy that President John Kennedy received. The original autopsy papers were destroyed by burning. Two men who were in the military assisted in the autopsy that had never done autopsies before, and this was a political autopsy done by the military, and it was not the accurate account of how President John Kennedy died. The autopsy of Robert Kennedy is being opened right now. The coroner, uh, we've talked about this on other shows, uh, Dr. Thomas Noguchi has stated clearly where the bullet went one inch from the back of the head of Robert Kennedy, and because of that, he was discredited, Dr. Noguchi, and they fired him as the coroner in Los Angeles, and he had a lawsuit. He, he fought back and was reinstated. But in the process of that, it turned out that the man who had him fired was Stuart Bryan, who comes in from the intelligence agencies, who's neither a doctor nor a lawyer, and is signing justifiable homicide when there are actually assassination squads in the Los Angeles Police Department, the Sheriff Department, killing Chicanos and blacks. The coroner, assistant coroner in Monterey County is Robert Shaw of military intelligence. He's not a doctor. These, these men that are deciding about whether or not there should be an autopsy or the extent of the autopsy are political people in that they can cover up major crimes that don't appear political at the time and even those that are. So I suggest that as many of you as possible write letters to Mr. Senator Moscone, M-O-S-C-O-N-E, in Sacramento, and ask for information about this bill where the coroner determines the extent of inquiry. A coroner, a political coroner, and that doesn't mean registered Republican or Democrat, that, that means a government agent can have a position in major cities where political assassinations are going to take place. And he could say this person died of a certain reason, and then nobody else could go in and check it out. It's very important that when we have these new laws coming down with all this violence and these scare tactics, that people can go in, other doctors than the official state doctor, can be paid a certain amount to do that autopsy and see that body and see what really took place. Uh, a lot of you wonder sometimes what good do letters do. 
uh, do they have any effect when you write to these people or go to these hearings? And I brought in an article, you may have seen it was from last week, but we didn't have time to cover it in depth. It was an article about the future of San Quentin prisons. And for those of you that listen to the programs regularly, I was complaining in Sacramento about Ronald Reagan wanting to put $2 million into architectural plans for two large prisons that would be involved in a great deal of behavior modification and handling of minorities, and he wanted to put uh, $82 million in San Diego, $82 million up in Vacaville. The committee, the Finance Committee in Sacramento, turned Ronald Reagan down, and this is an article from the San Francisco Chronicle. It said, after two hours of testimony, the Assembly Ways and Means Budget Subcommittee shelled the administration request for $1.1 million in planning funds. He had actually asked for two. They asked that no new prisons be built until Governor Ronald Reagan leaves office. I might have mentioned this on one of the shows, I don't remember, but it's important to know that they associate Ronald Reagan with pushing these prisons that is a very controversial subject, and they realize how important it is for him to have these prisons, but they want to put it off until he leaves office. Now, if we continue having these zombie killings in San Francisco, which are police military operation, I'm sure they are and could be checked out. If we keep having those, then people will rush for the new prisons. Um, there was an article in the paper this week about a man who's returning to California. His name is Eugene Austin. He's in Carson City right now. And he spent, he's 51 years old and he spent 33 years in prison. He's 51 years old and he's going to be paroled now, but he can't see. He's blind anymore. And one article said that he was blind because he spent so many years in a darkened cell. He was supposed to have been in solitary confinement for 10 years and lost his eyesight, just left in a dark room, and he went blind in this dark room. Uh, there's another account that the particular man had, uh, they called it an ice box, 14 years in the ice box he, said he was in and lost his eyesight, and they also said that he received a brain lobotomy, that they gave him a prefrontal lobotomy and then sent him back into the prison population so that now that he's blind and considered passive, he's being paroled. He's lost his eyesight, and his personality has changed by a brain operation. And another article, a UPI article, said that 10 years ago he began losing his vision possibly because of injuries possibly because of injuries. They don't say that the injuries definitely caused it. In 53, he got a lobotomy, and then uh, 10 years ago, he started to lose his eyesight. And the relationship with the prefrontal lobotomy surgery and the loss of eyesight, uh, can the eyesight could be caused by the lobotomy, and now that his personality's changed and he's lost his eyesight, he's gonna be paroled. And we have to check in what this surgery does. The prison then has a prisoner who uh, loses his temper uh, subdued. But we don't know if his temper is subdued because he never had a fair trial and he's in there against his wishes and against the court. He didn't, if he had a lawyer to defend him like John Mitchell and Marie Stans, maybe he wouldn't lose his temper. And it's hard to tell whether the prison violence is coming from the nature of the confinement and nothing biological at all. There's another prisoner in Virginia this week who ripped off his ear and it was sewn on. And I'm reading the article because it said a, a Richmond City jail inmate ripped off his right ear because he complained of hearing noises. He said he had a transistor radio behind his ear, but the nurse didn't see one. Well, the nurse wouldn't see it because a lot of these radio control experimentations are surgically implanted in the head. This is what Lawrence Kwong was, went to a detective about in San Francisco, that he was programmed to a radio station and um, a KGO. So this fellow who, who ripped off his ear, because that is a very unusual and painful procedure, I read the article to see what medication or treatment he had, and there weren't too many details except that he did claim that there was a transistor in his ear. Now, the, there is a magazine that I've referred to, I think, on this show before Intellectual Digest that a friend uh, gave to me a January 74 issue that goes into brain implants and plans to uh, treat prisoners uh, surgically in order to give them instructions, put electrodes into their brains. 
and I'm getting a lot of mail asking me for information where people can look up these facts. And I'll give you an address. There's an organization uh, called Science Against the People, Scientists and Engineers for Social and Political Action. And they have a booklet out called Science Against the People. And it's the story of Jason, electronic uh, uh, control of people and weapons, which another radio listener gave me this book. And you write to P.O. Box 4161, Berkeley, California. Scientist and Engineer for Social and Political Action, P.O. Box 4161, Berkeley, California. Or you can write to Dr. Peter Bregan, B-R-E-G-G-I-N, 1827 19th Street, Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20009. Now, this particular booklet that I have here on Science Against the People has an article um, about the electrodes that are put in the brain and the transponder surveillance. And I'll read this to you. This first surfaced in 1971, what the Defense Department was funding. And here's the title of some of the other articles, The Electronic Soldier, Concepts for Future Infantrymen, The Operations of the D.C. Executive Command Center, The Value of Life and Combat Risk. And Joseph A. Meyer is a computer specialist working for the National Security Agency who has developed a transponder surveillance system. And it's based on these three ideas. First, people on parole or out on bail or who've been in prison, and recidivists who've been in prison and went out on the streets and went back again. Each will carry a small radio transponder, which never can be removed as a condition of their being released from prison. And this transponder emits a radio signal, which gives a positive and unique identification. Then it's a network of surveillance transceivers that will interrogate the transponders in the neighborhood. And there will be a real time, a computer that receives the reports, updates the location, keeps inventory of each person who wears the transponder. And each subscriber must be accounted for at all times. And in urban areas, a mesh of transceivers will scan the streets communicating with central computers to provide a public surveillance network. And Meyer goes on to talk about the problems in Harlem and group actions and large-scale confrontations among juveniles. Now, a large part of our budget that's going into military hardware could be used to end gang war and juvenile fights in the big cities that are taking place now. But there is evidence and documentation to show how the LEAA is funding organizations and foundations that go in to this particular kind of street violence instead of staying away from it. The Ford Foundation and other fronts are encouraging this violence and then they can come back in with these transponders and keep track of everybody uh, walking out on the streets that they feel is a potential danger. You, There are people up at uh, Santa Cruz and Stanford University, University of California, all involved in making this kind of equipment. So you can write a letter to, um, here's a list of Jason members who are, it's published by the University Military Police Complex. And you can write box 226 Berkeley, California, 94701, and get a list of, it's called the Jason members who are making this electronic equipment to attach to people. Now the San Quentin news came today. Uh, we take that newspaper at the house and it said the March parole records were reported. 236 men appeared, and of that, 41 received parole dates. The same thing happened in January and February. The denial rate was 82.6% in March. The previous denial rate was 85.2%. Men that have served their time that are eligible for parole are not being let out, and they're being doubled in the cells and in that side they're importing violence and street gangs into the prison systems in order to perfect a method of controlling all radicals and all street people. Experimentation is being done on prisoners, and the way you have the use of the prisoners is by allowing this violence and keeping the men inside of the population doubles, and they get frustrated and resort to violence. And then the experiments begin on the prisoners, and then the next they belong to the population at large. As a matter of fact, in the San Quentin News, uh, there's a gentleman who writes for it by the name of George Schroeder, an article called Bastille by the Bay, 
And they asked him, why don't you write about the adjustment center, the solitary confinement in the prison, and tell what it's like. And he wrote, he said, I've experienced Attica segregation unit, the box it's called, and I was a part of that prison. And he goes on to tell what it's like to be incarcerated in solitary confinement and in the cells. But what he said is the changes are not confined to those inside. The changes are not going to take place from those inside the prison. He can write all he wants about it. But he said the changes are going to take place by a society as a whole. It is a safe to assume that the average citizen is aware that the prison is not a nice place to be. We who are prisoners know this also, and what we do about social problems, such as our prisons, is greatly determined by society. The prisoner can change himself. The type of surroundings that this change may take place in is in the hands of society. Tell it how it is. There's a great deal wrong with our present penal system. It would cost a lot of money to correct it, but people are reluctant to do it. They'll, you see, they'll put more money into bigger prisons and more guards, but they're reluctant to change it. And I think it's up to us on the outside to spend as much time as we can trying to help the men on the inside. And in turn, it helps us ourselves. But it's a very important thing to become aware of how much repression is coming down right in California in the prisons and how much more could be done when we begin to divert our energy or attention to that situation, the same energy we did to the Vietnam War or Cambodia should be going into our California and national prisons. Now, the Watergate uh, affair, I'm not going to talk much about the indictment on Marie Stans and um, uh, John Mitchell. One of the important things in the trial was that there's, you can't get a strong prosecution against the former attorney general. Uh, John Mitchell came from New York. He knows the people in New York, the lawyers, and the evidence of a strong prosecution. A lot of it was in the hands of Murray Chotner. Robert Vesco said from Costa Rica that Murray Chotner uh, knew a, a lot about what happened with the Vesco contributions and John Mitchell and Murray Stance. But Murray Chotner conveniently died just while the trial was going on, while indictments were in. And a deciding witness once more is murdered, eliminated by a convenient automobile accident on a Sunday afternoon. And I've never read anything else about in the paper about the gentleman who hit him any more than the one who hit Robert Crown, who was jogging in Sacramento. These important people, and they are important politically, socially, in our state, in our country, are run over and killed, just like the murders in the movie Z. And then the prosecution for um, John Mitchell and Robert Fisco is weak enough that the jury throws out the case, and that's what they call justice in America. The justice would serve if there is no case and they threw it out. But justice isn't served when every possible means is done to alter the evidence that would go in the hands of the prosecution and the prosecution is weak. Uh, justice isn't served, but I heard Howard K. Smith on the news this afternoon saying it is in New York. I don't agree that it is. Now, the paper this week, there's an article, a second Haldeman fund reported. I don't know why that comes out in the news April 27th that Robert Haldeman had a separate fund in his White House uh, desk, two-inch thick stack of $100 bills and $20 bills. It came out a long time ago and should have been investigated a year ago. Uh, Mr. Higby, who worked at the desk, he's now in the Office of Management Budget, and he worked with Robert Haldeman. He said the money was given to Haldeman late in '68 after Mr. Nixon's election as president, and it was to be passed on to staff members who needed moving expenses. Moving expenses reminds me of migratory birds involved in political assassinations. Well, I got out one article from August of 73, that's six months ago, on the money that Mr. Haldeman had in his desk, in the White House desk, and it had to do with John Ehrlichman and Anthony Lasowitz. And one example of the kind of money the White House was dishing out. I'll read you from the Washington Post. It said one of the most mysterious activities of Tony Lasswitz was the renting of a New York City apartment in the 300 block of the either East or West 46th Street in late 71. Lasswitz received money to rent one bedroom apartment from President Nixon's former personal attorney, Herbert Kalmbach. Lasswitz had told government attorneys the apartment was to be used as an office for a private detective agency. The agency would conduct White House investigations under the name of Sandwich, a plan proposed by White House aide John Caulfield. 
but the apartment was furnished with velvet wallpaper, fur rugs, hardly the, de hardly the decor for a private detective agency. They used it to seduce female friends. The late Mary Jo Kopechny was killed in, in Senator Edward Kennedy's automobile in the accident at Chappaquiddick. The scheme involved hiring a good-looking man to seduce the women in the apartment and have pictures taken secretly, blackmail the women into revealing details about Mary Kopechny and the party that took place at Chappaquiddick. And it goes into other... Uh, operations of Mr. Laswitz. He received from the White House $100,000. Um, he was up at Chappaquiddick right after the accident. He was never called as a witness to say when he arrived there. Now, out of Mr. Haldeman's desk, there was another article in August 73, was money to defeat George Wallace. And they, they said Attorney General Bill Baxley, um, uh, who was investigating in Alabama, said he will press investigation to determine who brought a reported 400000 into the campaign with the avowed purpose of beating Wallace in 72. The transaction is a violation of state contributions, campaign contributions. The former White House Chief of Staff Haldeman, H.R. Haldeman, testified he authorized the transfer of money left over from the 68 primaries to support a candidate running against Wallace in 70. It was a belief of friends of the president's and advisors of the Southern political scene that Mr. Wallace might very well become a third-party candidate in 1972 and thus raise the potential problem of an indecisive election that would be turned over to the House of Representatives. Now, Mr. Dent, uh, Mr. Harry Dent was given $1,500 by Haldeman, according to Mr. Higby, and so was a Mr. Bill Gavin. Harry Dent was one of the people in charge of the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy eliminated George Wallace. The funding uh, as a candidate for the election, an opponent to Richard Nixon that would take these 26 million votes away. The Watergate keeps going on and on and never gets into the funding, the evidence of funding of the murder of Mary Jo Kopechny or the uh, assassination attempt of George Wallace. Here's all his money floating around or the 1968 money that was given, uh, cash that was paid out after Robert Kennedy was killed into the White House as money was flowing in and out of the White House, both directions, whether it was a payoff for covering it up or a payment to people uh, who could kill Robert Kennedy and be involved in Los Angeles, the Ambassador Hotel down there. These investigations were never and have never been opened up. The Watergate does not touch anything to do with the people that were murdered, like J. Edgar Hoover, Mary Jo Kopechny, George Wallace, and um, the, the attempted shooting of Wallace and the Robert Kennedy in 68. Even the 72 alone, the Wallace, the Mary Joan Kopechny, or Mrs. Dorothy Hunt. There's no intention of the committee, Senate Select Committee, which is supposed to fold camp in May and give a report on financing of the elections, will accomplish anything it started out to do. Um, the message about the Haldeman Fund is important to follow through, but it will not be followed through Yes, he had a separate desk. It was different than the callback Segretti Fund or Dwight Chafin Fund. It was his own special fund, and it did go to the Southern strategy and to the South where Wallace was knocked out of the election, but um, nobody's going to investigate that. And as long as they don't, uh, these major murders in the barrier will escalate because they're all related to the murders in Washington. There were, in March, there was an article about the Watergate cover-up is unraveling, layer by layer. And it said, greed, this is a quotation from, uh, it was the San Francisco Chronicle. It said, greed, fear, a sudden accidental death, and spies who couldn't take the heat were among the elements that peeled away layer after layer in the Watergate cover-up. And now only the heart of it remains behind the last layer, torn in places and wearing thin. But in the way of the cover-up burglary, of the headquarters of June 17, 1972, has, it has been thin from the beginning, and it was suspected and charged and leaked and reported upon. Yet there were too many layers disguised the source of ultimate guilt. If there was to, one to pick a time and a place when it all began to fall apart, it would have been, it is December the 8th, in the rain and fog over Chicago at 2.27 p.m. at Midway Airport when the United States airline Boeing 737 crash short of the runway. Among the 40 who died was Dorothy Hunt, the wife of one of the original Watergate defendants, E. Howard Hunt, and Mrs. Hunt's handbag investigators found $10,000 in $100 bills. And although the discovery 
touched off speculation that she was a courier of cover-up money. Relatives said the money was for a business investment. The murder of Mrs. Hunt then goes on to say made James McCord nervous, and I'm sure he was nervous about his family and his wife and children. It turned out his wife was burning typewriter ribbons and was an espionage wife, just like Dorothy Hunt or a lot of other well-known espionage wives. And so some of the story began to open up, but the death of Dorothy Hunt, the shooting of Wallace, the death of Mary Jo Capeshny have not even been touched, and they've been on this thing two years, and the funding for these operations in the White House could be checked to particular agents and show how these political assassinations or attempted assassinations are done from the White House down and not from the street up, the lone assassin story. Well, the remaining 12 minutes, we're going into the Hearst a little bit more. We don't have much time. Patricia Hearst made the posters this week, the FBI most wanted posters. I think that's obscene and disgusting. I, I couldn't stand it when I saw it. Yes, she was in a bank, but we don't know what duress she was under. She was kidnapped, and you heard the news tonight about Mary Alice Sims saying that uh, Donald DeFries threatened to kill her and her children and Theo Wheeler, and uh, they went into hiding. So Patricia Hearst has been with the other people three months, and there's no way to know what she's injected with, what she's programmed with, what a person will do in battle to stay alive, just like you would in, if you were captured in any territory where you're not sure of the terrain. Uh, to come out with these remarks that she's dead or she's part of the SLA or she's a gun holding these guns and capable of shooting machine guns within three month period, a true revolutionary, it's impossible to believe and it's impossible to even guess what her state of mind is until you find her and hopefully find her alive. If she's found dead, the theories will be going, thrown all over the place. The San Francisco Examiner, April 28th, yesterday, had an article by H. Bruce Franklin from the Venceremos. He said, the founder of the SLA subverts the radical causes. This is an article, and Franklin goes on to say, far from being revolutionaries, Many members of the SLA are insects preying on the revolution. He's turned the saying around that where they said, death to the fascist insect that preys on the life of the people. Franklin says the activities of the SLA up to this time have done a great deal to damage the revolutionary movement, and they've played in the hands of the most reactionary forces in the United States. SLA General F Field Marshal Sin Q may be an agent provocateur, for an unnamed police agency. I don't know why Franklin protects himself by saying unnamed. I go ahead and say it's the Los Angeles Police Department. He, he went on to say that robbing banks would be an okay revolutionary act, but shooting innocent bystanders never is. Contracting to SLA's rhetoric, it has a profound hostility towards the working people. Franklin said the SLA may actually be led by police agents. Franklin noted reflecting a view held by other radical quarters. The main one here is that he has a history of cooperation with the police departments. Franklin said DeFries has a reputation of reporting his prison enemies to authorities. This was the action of a pig. It is not impossible that Sin Q, Donald DeFries, is a planted agent performing outrageous terrorist acts to convince people that revolutionaries are the enemy of the people. Now those outrageous acts, we got an inkling. Patricia Hurst said there will be more to come. Uh, if you don't believe my message, there's more to come. There's been a few hints by the police department and others that we are in for another shock. If it's not one week apart, it'll be 10 days apart. Um, uh, Stephen Weed made the remark that she may even, the next thing is to kill somebody. Uh, we don't know. You can be programmed to kill somebody. You'd be programmed to forget it after you do it. After three months there and going on four months, there's no way to know, as I say, what frame of mind she's in. But Mr. Franklin had occasion to know that Vince Ramos was almost unfiltered by these people and they kicked them out. He goes on to say, when people run around and kidnap young women, shoot black educators, shoot people passing banks, and issue statements that sound crazy, most people are going to look in some place and they're going to hope that these people get caught. And it makes people look for protection to the police and the law enforcement and they'll do whatever they want them to do. And he talked about the innocent people gunned down in front of the bank. He said the SLA's hostility towards working people is visible in the terrorist words and actions. When a few imposters like the SLA come along as if they were revolutionaries 
who conduct themselves in an inhuman manner. All I do is turn people away from looking to revolutionary alternatives for the solution of their problems. Most of the people in the SLA don't have any sense or semblance of political education or any feeling on the life of oppressed people in the United States or anywhere. Now that's what Mr. Franklin was saying. He's been active in political movements and taught at Stanford. And this week the Berkeley Barb has an article by David Dubois, editor of the Black Panther newspaper. And he, this article says that it leads support to the research of Mae Russell and Donald Freed that Sinkyu is working for the cops. And in saying in a recent speech, he said the purpose of SLA is to discredit all radical organizations and particularly black. Dubois goes on to say the so-called zebra killings in San Francisco are linked with the actions of SLA to create paranoia and polarize the black and white community. Nixon needs such a condition to overcome the efforts to get him out of the White House. Now, I disagree with Mr. Dubois on this point. I think the SLA was planned in 69, long before the Watergate arrest took place, because after Richard Nixon was president, then the beginning of the elimination of the minorities would take place. This complicated uh, conspiracy you're seeing in the Bay Area didn't begin as a diversionary to Richard Nixon's problems. It, the elimination of the minority began in the National Security Council 10, 15, 20 years ago. And this is just one stage. This thing just didn't pop. This is a complicated conspiracy with all its intricacies. It's easy to break down if people can follow it every day or every week. What Dubois said is the scapegoats are the blacks. Tomorrow it will be all distant people, the poor and the unneeded people. He's right about that. And he's talking about the linking of racism at home to U.S. foreign policy. But I disagree that Nixon is doing as the diversionary Nixon is a captive in the White House, and this would have taken place. Just a few headlines this week. I wrote down just a few of them from the paper this week. I'm sure you're reading them. One says, these are all between February 22nd and the 29th, just in the last week. And these are headlines, not sections from articles. One says, terrorists might get the atomic bomb. We need new safeguards. Another says, zebra searchers flood San Francisco streets. Another large one, New York Times, executive son is 12th victim, shooting of whites in San Francisco linked to black militants. Now, there is no link. That's the New York Times. White, black, executive son. They get all that in in one headline. There is no proof that these are militants any more than I say that they're whites that have injections to turn black, like the book Black Like Me. There's no, these single things, there's no evidence at all that these are militants. But that's New York headlines. Executive, whites, black militants. The next one says, Britain's debate on how to treat terrorism. Another headline, zebra-style killing spreads to Sacramento. And they round up some black Muslims. Remember the FBI memo that said even if they haven't done anything wrong, get them off the streets and arrest them, you know, just prior like to election time and scare tactics. And by the time they get themselves out, it will have served the purpose. So the zebra killing spreads to Sacramento where you legislatures and people up there can be concerned that policemen and Vietnam veterans and uh, that have been shot out and one killed, it's going to spread up to you. So that's where the laws are made. It's natural that it gets to Sacramento. Another headline, the alarming rise of politicized crime. Another one, zebra slows the city. That tells about all the uh, North Broadway, and nobody is at the theater, six or eight people, but they're all at the establishment, the opera house, and the cultural change taking place. Go to the Rotary Club, and you're safe. Another headline, the shocking kidnapping epidemic. That's in the National Enquirer. They don't dare list one of the kidnapping epidemics because I claim that all 20, so far 19 or 20, are phony. A lot of them came out. The one in Florida is being hushed up. The bankers being a phony kidnapping. Evidence is coming up of Mr. Peterson, the envoy in Mexico, is being a phony kidnapping. They're all phony. All this rash of kidnappings are phony. Yet an article says the shop, shocking kidnapping epidemic, but they don't name one. Then there's a beauty that came out. Hillsborough police seek special funds. Now they're asking $91,000 to teach corporate executives how to protect themselves from kidnapping and other harm. You see, the Hillsborough police are seeking $91,000 to help corporate executives. But the Berkeley police, and I was going to bring in today, and I didn't have time for the whole show to go into the amount of money going into computerized police departments up and down the state that runs into the billions. 
The San Francisco, the Oakland Police Department had the name Patricia Campbell Hurst for three weeks, and it talks about operations and running vans. It's an art student, and they're going to kidnap her. They have three weeks to pick up a telephone and call her parents, and they can't do it. And now they're asking $91,000 in Hillsborough to teach the executives. Another headline, the, bo the bodyguard business is booming. That's uh, one of the motives I've listed on other shows, 15 motives for the SLA, and, and one of them is private security forces like they had in Nazi Germany. So the bodyguard business is booming. Another headline, college uh, uh, safety set up on campus security. They're gonna, colleges are going to have campus security. Another one says FBI details the Chinese Communist Manual and the influence in the Hearst kidnapping. And they're going to try to link this to the Maoists because uh, Chairman Mao said you can kidnap the rich and demand to feed the poor. But they don't tell you at the House where the people, uh, uh, Joseph Romero and uh, uh, lived and little up in uh, Concord in California where Nancy Ling Perry was and these great revolutionaries, they also had the rise and fall of the Third Reich and American military manuals. Romero and Little also had American military manuals and uh, information on guerrilla warfare put out in America that has nothing to do with Mao at all and the rise and fall of the Third Reich and a lot of fascist literature. So there is this attempt to link it to the Chinese Maoist influence. Again, like I said last week, because they ate Chinese food or cooked Chinese food and sold it or called their house Peking House. So the, these are just a few. I can't even go into all the headlines this week of the scare tactics. And then there's another one. If you read last week, about three weeks ago, when they said the radicals, uh, Senator Harmer was up at the civil disorder hearings in Sacramento saying that radicals are linked to a large group of terrorists and the people should begin to inform on each other. And the FBI comes out this week and asks citizens to aid in locating kidnap Patty. Now they can find all these other kidnappings, but what they want to do, have you ever seen such strong people appear that they're helpless, like Raymond Precunier came out last week and said, it's all my fault, implying he must have been good, too good to the prisoners, the SLA was formed there. And now the FBI is saying, well, we're very weak and impotent. You've got to help us find Patty, the mighty FBI. Why? Because they want neighbors to get used to looking at each other, surveying each other, turn in the Jew, turn in the black, turn in the ex-prisoner. He's asking the citizens to help aid locate. They're going to supposed to find locate Patty. Well, our time is running up. Uh, we read about two getaway cars that were found in San Francisco, nine blocks from the bank robbery. And there was some mention that one of the cars was found the next day. Why does it take seven days to find the getaway car? Because you can say down in Monterey County, you can look for every black person. You can look at everybody's green car, get your eyes used to snooping each other. You can try to tie it into Monterey, Santa Cruz County. They had those cars within days or one day, but they want people to be looking. And the excuse to look is they don't have the cars. And after they put out the alerts, you find they had the cars after all. Well, our time is up. T Patty Hearst made the cover of Time, the cover of Newsweek. The whole thing is obscene. Uh, there's a group now of what they call nine people, and America is hysterical into terrorists, Maoists, uh, atomic bombs, snoop on your neighbor. Um, we could do a whole show every week on it. I did want to go into the prison things today with you, and um, there just isn't enough time. So keep reading the papers. I'll see you next week. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for over 10 years has been researching the facts behind the political assassinations in this country so that the truth may be revealed. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KLRB-FM in Carmel, California.